Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Josh, our next speaker. Uh, and the topic is how to help corporate teams connect meaningfully. And Josh was here yesterday. So uh, uh, some of the people who are already here, some of you already um, know Josh from yesterday. And for those who are new, uh, just a few words about who Josh is. Uh, Josh is a two-time TEDx speaker and the number one best-selling author of Initiative and Leadership Step-by-Step. Step. Josh is the host of the award-winning Leadership and Environmental Podcast and professor at NYU. Josh teaches and coaches leadership and entrepreneurship at NYU and Columbia Business School. Josh has spoken at Harvard, Princeton, West, Princeton, West Point, and other renowned corporations. With that, Josh, I am going to hand it over to you. Take it over. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. If yeah. not, let me know. Mickey, I'm good? Yes, you're good. Great. So I'm going to uh, start with a story about uh, myself and a big change that I went through, why making a meaningful connection became some, such an important thing for me. And I'll give a little bit of background about myself before that. First, a little preview. But partway through, I'm going to ask for a volunteer, and it's going to be a fun exercise. And the person who volunteers is going to learn the most. So if you are interested in volunteering, please raise your hand so that when the time comes, Mickey knows to be able to turn on your audio. And so we'll be able to do the exercise together. And again, you're going to be the person who learns the most. So I hope, I hope that happens. And all these slides are going to be available. In particular, the one um, there's going to be one big slide that you realize is the, the important one. And hopefully, you can see my email and how to connect with me at the bottom. So that's all there. So you don't have to scribble stuff down really quickly. Sometimes people feel they have to. Uh, just, just so you know, Annette is going to volunteer. She raised her hand, so. Ah, thank you, Annette. Yeah. I look forward to talking to you in a little bit. And all right, here's, I'm gonna go very quickly about myself. Minky described myself a bit and probably some of you heard me uh, yesterday and so know a bit more, but I have a PhD in physics, there I'm getting it. I helped build, build a satellite. That satellite is orbiting the earth and still taking data. Very exciting. Uh, I left uh, left physics and, and academia in order to start my first company. So here we have the Wall Street Journal, the first, my mom's very proud of my being first mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. Now, those who are look carefully, they'll see that 2001, we were about to head into a recession, not the easiest time to start a company. I got squeezed out by the investors, even though we were operating on four continents, things had been going well. Uh, I went back to get an MBA and then since then, leadership, coaching, teaching, and practice has been my main focus. I've become a teacher at NYU and coach at Columbia. I teach online at Spodic Academy. Here's my Columbia slide and my Spodic Academy, where I teach online. Uh, I have a blog. I do a lot of public speaking. Of course, now with Corona, it's difficult to say how that'll change. Also, the Leadership in the Environment podcast has, been, has become a very well-known podcast, and that factors in here in a little bit. So in a little bit, I'm gonna switch and show you the podcast and why that's relevant to a meaningful connection. And I've also become a best-selling author. So the big book here, Leadership Step-by-Step, Step, is the exercise that we're going to do today is in unit four of the book of how to lead others. The first units are understand yourself, lead yourself, understand others, and lead others. And meaningful connection is the introduction to how to lead other people and for those who know in the educational world, this is project-based learning. It's very experiential, active, and it's not just telling you principles. I would not have written this book if it was just gonna tell you principles. It gives you exercises to practice so that you develop these skills. So why I learned them, I, a little bit of background about myself. I wanna go back to when I was in graduate school. I'm getting my PhD and I'm getting my PhD in physics. It's it's the top field, uh, it's a top degree in a, in a very difficult field. Looking back now, I realized that I only knew how to follow. That is, I couldn't come up with my own problems to work on. I would go to my advisor and I'd say, I just finished the last thing you had me work on. Is there something else for me to work on? And he'd say, sure, here's another problem to work on. I go away, I'd come back, I'd say, I finished it. I'd do a really good job. But all I could do is kind of, I wouldn't describe this this way then, but I was lurching forward. I would just solve problems that people told me how to solve. 
not useless, but as a graduate student, I was certainly cheaper than hiring an engineer, but I wasn't solving my own things. And that led me to wonder, after a while, I don't really, I didn't really like what I was doing. And I asked myself, what could I do with a PhD in physics? Outside that field, you would think, well, that's a big degree. That's a challenging field. Probably the world would be open to you. Actually, when you're in the field, what you feel is, well, I could keep doing what I was doing, but I didn't really want to do that. It was research wasn't what I wanted to do. I could go into industry, which would mean military industrial. I didn't really want to do that. I could go to Wall Street. That wasn't the right world for me. I felt I had a very limited number of options because what else could I do with this particular degree except those few things? The thing is that now when I work with corporate clients, I get almost the same. They feel like, what can I do from where I am now? And they don't really, all they can think of is the next step in their, in the corporate ladder. And a lot of them don't really know how to even do that. I put to you that you do not want people in your teams, in your companies. You don't want yourself to be feeling like all I can do is the next step forward, that they can solve problems that other people give them, but they can't solve, they can't come up with new problems. I mean, you really want, when people know how to find new problems and solve them, they tend to get promoted because CEOs don't want people who can, they want, if you can find new problems and solve them, CEOs don't want you in low level positions solving easy problems or small problems. They want you solving big problems. So that gets people promoted. And I find one of the great ways to find what problems there are to solve is to ask people and to make you, well, you need to have a connection with someone in order for them to open up and share with you. And that means how to make a meaningful connection. The thing was that school never, I don't know about you, but school didn't teach me how to build relationships. It taught me that relationships were important and it taught me some psychology of, you know, you, I could read papers of what people did, but I didn't actually practice it myself. I don't know about you, but I came out of school knowing to make connections, but not how to. Meanwhile, when I looked at classmates in graduate school who did have mentors, who were able to make these connections, I saw that they had better projects. In academia, you want to publish. So I saw they published more and they enjoyed themselves more. They liked what they were doing more, but I didn't know how to do that. In business school, I learned that you could develop those skills, but again, to learn that you can do something doesn't give you practice doing those things. So I didn't really know how to do it. So business school didn't teach those things. Now, the 15 years since has been for me developing in myself how to do these things. And I'm going to show you the meaningful connection exercises, which, which is one of the fundamental tools that I use to do to learn myself and to teach others, but also how to teach and coach, not just teaching principles, not just teaching to read and write papers and learn principles of things, but actually to do them confidently and effectively. So I'm going to tell you two stories about me trying to make connections with others. The first story is, this is a couple of years after business school. I happen to be, I live in Greenwich Village and nearby one of the universities there had a panel discussion. And one of the people on the panel was an author whose book I read and made a big difference for me. And I thought, I've learned to make all these connections. I'm going to go connect with this person. I think it's going to make, be valuable for me to know this guy. And so I go to the discussion and we've all been to panels before, and this isn't a picture of the actual one, but you know what they're like. There's one person who's the moderator and then three or four other people or here, there's more talking about their books and so forth. And I go and the panel goes really well. And now I want to meet this guy. So at the end they break and there's wine and cheese and the guy comes down from stage and I go up to him and I say, I, I work up all the nerve because I don't really know the guy. I have no, no one inter intermediate to connect me with him. So I have to make a cold introduction. And I walk up to him and I walk, work up all the nerve. And I say, you know, I, I read your book. I wanted you to know it made a big difference for me. And I want to thank you very much. That was such an important book for me. And he turns to look at me and he says, well, thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me too. Now, I had worked up all the nerve I could just to say that. And I didn't know what to say next. So now picture me looking at him and him looking at me and I'm just staring at him and I'm, my mind starts racing and my mind starts saying, well, Josh, you started the connection, say something. And then my mind would say, well, he's not saying anything. I better say something soon because if I don't say something, he's going to think I'm weird. And now it's been a little while and it's getting even weirder. So I better say something, not just anything, but something really good. And now it's been even longer. So I said, I got to say something even better. And my mind's just racing. And maybe you felt this way before. 
And so it finally, I'm just like, ah, uh, I just stick my hand out and I go, well, uh, thank you very much. And I turn and walk away. And as I'm walking away, I had a friend there with me and she was a neighbor. And as we're walking away, she starts laughing at me. And I say, why are you laughing at me? I just tried to meet this guy and I did the best that I could. And she goes, how could I not laugh? That was just two geeks staring at each other, not knowing what to say or do. How could I not laugh at that? So that was me doing my best to connect despite having had an Ivy League business school education telling me to make connections. Now, I want to fast forward to a few years ago. I hope you people know the woman on your screen. Her name is Frances Hesselbein. Peter Drucker called her the best leader in America. She was the CEO of the Girl Scouts for more than a decade and a wonderful woman. I met her at a book release and she invited me to have coffee at her office one day. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go meet her. And as I'm getting to her office, I'm thinking to myself, I do leadership, she does leadership. She's been named the best leader in America. How can I connect with her? Do I wanna, and I thought, I don't wanna ask her questions because she's written so many books. I don't wanna ask her a question that might be in the book. I don't wanna be boring to her. And I think, you know, I'm gonna do my meaningful connection exercise. And by this time I practiced it for years and years and years. I walk into her office and her office, by the way, is incredible. Cause it's like pictures of her with every president since Reagan, her books are lining all over the place with they're, they're in every language you can think of. I mean, she's a phenomenal woman. And so I walk in and normally I would be cowed by the situation. In fact, her, her secretary sits me down on the couch. She pulls up her chair and she sits down face to face with me. She's like two feet away from me. And she says, so what would you like to talk about? Now she invited me and I felt like she's saying to me, the best leader in America is saying, you lead me. Normally I wouldn't know what to say, but I went right into the meaningful connection exercise, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And now I was scheduled for a 30 minute coffee with her. Three hours later, after we'd gone to lunch and came back, her secretary came back in and said, I apologize, Ms. Hasselbein for interrupting, but your next appointment is here. I'm afraid I have to ask this one to terminate, to, to end so that we can bring in the next person. And Francis turns to me and says, I don't remember a more delightful conversation. And this is the difference between having practiced something practical and having it in hand and something that you, you know how to do from having practiced it many times and just knowing in principle what to do. I can't stand when I read books and articles that are like, here's the principles of leadership. You know, uh, you gotta do stuff. And I wanna point out, this was not just me making a delightful conversation with her. This led to business. The guy you see here is my connection to her, uh, from her to West Point. This is general, four-star General Lloyd Austin, whom she introduced me to. And he brought me to West Point. And if you know about my podcast and so forth, I've done a lot of work at West Point since. And she also runs the Leader to Leader Journal. And it led to my first publication in a, in a leadership journal about the work that I do. So it's not just making connections socially, business happens too. Now I could have made small talk. And in person, I asked this a bit more, a bit more interactively. And maybe people could put it up in the chat, but why did I not say to her, I could have said to her, traffic on the way over sure was crazy, or the weather was sure was rough, or how about the Yankees? That's what people call small talk. Why, don't, why did people make small talk? I put that out for you to think about, because I don't know about you, most times when people introduce themselves to me, they tend to ask, maybe they'll, they'll talk about the weather, they'll talk about uh, sports. Nowadays, people talk about the virus, but they rarely talk about things that they really get excited about. I don't know about you, but I've, I, people have told me very clearly, when you first meet people, don't talk about religion and politics. It's kind of dangerous to do that. So be careful doing that. So why not talk about those? What I find is that people really care about those things. And because they care about them, people get into big arguments. And it's not such a great way to start a relationship, to start someone off with a disagreement, with an argument. I'm sure it's happened to you. It certainly happened to me. The result is that small talk, weather, traffic, sports, current events, those are meaning less. People don't really care about those things. And so the result is that you don't get into arguments, but you also don't get to know the other person and the other person doesn't get to know you. I know from before I developed this exercise and this way of learning and practicing and socializing, I had tons of relationships that were really meaningless. I'd get lots of 
business cards at, at events and I'd write on the card why this person was important to me and how to follow up with them. And I'd get resumes and I'd give out resumes, large numbers of things. And at social media, you can get lots of things like that too. But I didn't really get to know the people. That, was, that didn't go well for my social life. It didn't go well for my business life. And I put to you, I, I just really rarely talk about weather or sports except with people that I really know that there's no way I'm going to talk to for more than a little bit. But if there's people that I really want to work with, we get, we get this stuff across. And actually, let me switch where I'm sharing my screen to... Hopefully you guys are seeing my browser and this is my Leadership in the Environment podcast page. And this is the result of my meaningful connection is that the people that I've had on my podcast are some amazing people. The person with the most viewed TED talk of all time, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, McKinsey's three-time global managing director, these number one best-selling authors, an Olympic gold medalist, one of the heads of, of General Electric, a Navy SEAL officer. The, and I want to point out these people like Seth, the Nobel Prize winner, he comes over for dinner to my place a lot because he lives in Manhattan. And I don't just have, he's not just someone that I've had on my podcast. Virtually all of these people I've made connections with that we get to know each other pretty well. And that's because of the meaningful connection exercise. Let's see, let me go back to sharing the presentation. Hopefully you're seeing the presentation now. Yep. And now I wanna go into the meaningful connection exercise. I wanna point out it's useful in networking, but also job interviews in both directions. Probably some of you are people who, in, who interview a lot of others, not just are interviewed yourselves. It's useful in social events, so it's not just for business, but most of all, this is for teamwork. This is for whether you are someone who is in a team reporting to others, if you are in a team having others report to you, or you are someone in HR who puts teams together and it's your responsibility or a passion of yours to get people to rise up the ranks and take on more responsibilities. The Meaningful Connection, the meaningful connect, connection exercise is wonderful for those things. I use it at least weekly. I use it at least weekly. I'm trying to think. I haven't used it today, but I've used it this week already. And I don't want to say that this is the only way to create a meaningful connection. I'm not saying this is like the answer to everything, but for one thing, it works in terms of it makes a connection with the person you're doing it with. The other thing is that it teaches you skills. It teaches you how to do these things. It teaches you how not to get stuck in a situation like I did with the author at first. And so, okay, so the volunteer. I, I forget the person's name, but Mickey, is that person on yes. audio? Yes, she's uh, uh, unmuted. Hi, this is Annette. Annette, glad to meet you. And uh, thank you for volunteering. And we have not met before, is that right? Um, I actually have attended one of your talks in New York. Ah, well, glad to see you again. I didn't recognize you just by your voice. <laughs> this was a few years ago, thank you. Glad to see you again, uh, hear you again. And if you don't mind my asking, uh, do you mind sharing a passion of yours? Is, is there a passion you could share besides, besides work and family? Um, yes, travel. Travel. So when I, I like to travel a lot also, when I travel these days, since I'm not flying so much, I found that I can really explore a lot closer to home. I really love finding things that aren't that far away but are really whole different worlds. Like for example, I've learned to sail. And I grew up in a family that traveled a lot. Like my mom loves to travel because she likes to see different cultures and especially the food in places. Is it one of those things for you when you travel? What, what, what makes you travel? What leads you to travel? I, I love to travel because it opens my perspective. It makes me feel like the world is a smaller, safer place. And I, in 2020, was embarking on the niche market of travel leadership to bring that to busy executives and to um, students that are in at-risk situations. So travel leadership, I have not heard those, that phrase before. Can you clarify, Can you, do you mind expanding on that? Um, so I actually think I'm creating a new niche in the travel industry Obviously, with COVID-19, that's going to be different. Um, but what I understand about executive leaders is a lot of times 
empathy might be lacking, for instance, or there's certain comfort zones that people don't push themselves out of and travel gives you that kind of opportunity. And during my discovery process, I also learned of a program that helps students, um, teenagers in at-risk situations have the opportunity to build those courage skills as well. I'm really curious about at, when you, I, you mentioned at-risk students before, and I'm curious what at-risk students, is that, I can those guess, are, but I'm not sure. What, what does that are, mean? Those are kids that are students generally in below the poverty level that have probably not been further than one to five miles from where they live. This is, now this is fascinating to me and I really want to keep asking you about this. Uh, and I hope we get to afterward. Do you mind if I pause and ask uh, how you feel about what you're talking right now? I, you pro I, I should mention, this is not usually an exercise that's done blindly with people listening in unknown. So you might feel a little bit awkward because of that. But how I, I, do you feel I, about what you're sharing? I don't feel awkward at all. I feel so passionate about it. I, I took a sabbatical, a purpose-seeking sabbatical from August to December to go into a discovery process. And this was my aha in November. And I really believe I was born to help elevate people's capabilities in these two niche areas. Um, so I just, I'm very excited about this still, even despite us being, you know, sheltering in place, because I still think that there's ways to open up that discovery and that opportunity to the two niche markets that I, I mentioned. And I am really excited to find a place where I could possibly help break intergenerational cycles of poverty with the, with the student population that I talked about. I hope to continue this conversation with you afterward. I hope that you'll, if, if you'll be so kind as to email me, I'd, I'd love to follow up more. Definitely. And I hope you don't mind also for now to go meta back into this, sure. this uh, conversation. And do you feel comfortable sharing what you're sharing? And do you feel like it's a, is, do you feel like we're connecting? Definitely. And I feel very, um, very listened to and I feel your curiosity and it just stokes the passion I have about this project. I'm excited. I'm honored to hear that. Do you feel like I was running through a script? No. Now I happen to have been running through a script <laughs> and what I want to do next is to share with everybody, including you, what that script was so that people can do for the people that they meet what I did with you, I believe I helped you share something important to you and something meaningful. And Definitely. if it's thank if you, it's okay with you, I'm going to go and I'm going to describe the script to people so that everyone can practice it themselves. Thank you. So, thank you. And the reason I do a script, sometimes when people hear script, they think, oh, well, that's not really meaningful. That's just, it's not really you coming out. And I remind you that when actors learn a script, at first, it's not them but no two actors will do the same, will play the same role exactly the same. In fact, they really come out when they learn the script very well. Now, even Meryl Streep, when she first practices a script is gonna sound unrehearsed and, and, and um, wooden. And you will too, the first couple of times you do this, but the more that you practice, the more that you emerge as an individual, as yourself, as a unique person, even though the words are very similar. Now, after you do it more and more, you can start practicing it and, um, making it your own. But I recommend the first bunch of times you do it, like when you play piano scales, I recommend doing it word by word or very closely to the script that I give you, but after a while, then start improvising. This is to, saying to everybody. The script is this. Step one is ask the other person what they like to do. And I recommend saying besides work and family, not that work and family aren't things that people are passionate about, but they tend to, you get very the usual stuff over and over again that they've said many, many times. Personally, I like to say, what's your passion besides work and family? Some people feel passion isn't the right word for them at work. So you can say, what's a hobby of yours? What's something you like to do besides work and family? This gets in their heads something that's a passion of theirs. They don't always share that much because a lot of times at the beginning, people are thinking, 
well, I'm not sure who this person is, where they're going. I'm not going to give them my whole life story. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to open up completely. So they tend to give a fairly usual answer, travel, books, food. Sometimes it might be movies. If it's movies, I tend to ask, is it something you actively do? Do you like write reviews or just passively watch? Because you, you want them to share something that they actively do. The next step is pretty challenging. And the first couple times you do it, but the, the main thing is the parts in green you have to think about on the fly before you do it. So I recommend the first couple times you practice this, pause before doing this step. I could do it quickly because I've done it many times. So I say, oh, cool. You know, I know in my case, I said, someone you know who does that thing. So I talked about me as someone who travels. I travel. And my reason is that I like to discover things that are nearby that I wouldn't have found otherwise than someone else. And so in my case, it was my mom. She travels and for her, oh, man, I could tell stories about her and the food that she comes back with and all the things that she learns. So the basic step is cool. I know someone you know who does the thing that they mentioned and give that person's reason, not just that they do it, but the reasons because reasons are emotions and feelings and motivations. And when you talk about feelings and motivations, that's where the meaning is. And then someone else who does it, who also does it, and for their reason, and then say, what do you do it for? And usually the person will then, they're gonna give a significantly longer answer. I wanna point out why. Usually at this step, when they say what they say, they, what they do, they share the thing, but they also have a, a bit of protection. They wanna know who you are. Is this person gonna judge me? Because when you share something that you care about, you're open to being judged, you're open to being manipulated, it makes you vulnerable. Now, I could say to the person, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to manipulate you. You can feel comfortable being vulnerable with me. But the person who would judge them would also say the same thing, just like people who tell the truth say I tell the truth. People who lie say I tell the truth. So you can't just say it. Words are cheap. You have to demonstrate it. And this step speaks about two people in your life who do the thing that that person does in a supportive, non-judgmental way. Now, everyone reacts differently because everyone's a unique person, but I've had this exercise done with me many, many, many times. And when someone says, talks to me about people who do what I do in a supportive, non-judgmental way, it makes me feel like, oh, if I share about myself, they'll, they'll talk about me in a supportive, non-judgmental way. Finally, someone I can share what this is really about for me. So their next step is they're gonna generally talk significantly longer. They're gonna go in, in more depth and almost always they're going to share, see, the words that they say can't possibly convey all of what's in their heads and in their hearts. And you'll find that some of what they can't put into words, the emotion, the deeper emotion, the meaning of what they say will often come in sometimes unusual word choices or words that they stress or pause after or words that they repeat several times. So when I heard her say, um, leadership travel, if I remember right. That's something I don't usually hear those words together in just that way. So I asked her that and I, and the next step is to use their meaning carrying words and ask them to clarify those words. So go back and uh, if you get the, the, the recording of this, go back and listen. And I think that I said, you mentioned leadership travel and I wonder if you could clarify that. And she went in more depth. And at this stage, she starts, and almost everyone you do this exercise with at this point will talk in significantly more depth and you'll start hearing things coming from the heart that they really care about a lot and they like sharing these things. In fact, they welcome sharing these things and they, they will view you as someone who, so you did the hard work of making them feel comfortable by showing them support and not judgment. Now, she, I remember at the end, she said at risk youth, which that, that was also something that seemed meaning caring and she repeated it. So I asked her about that and she went into more depth about that. And I asked her afterward, asking her afterward, how, how did it go? How did you feel? That was not part of the script. But when you do this exercise, people will generally share with you something very meaningful for them and they'll go into depth and they'll feel comfortable about it. And it's almost hard not to keep talking about it. Actually, at this stage, usually, I feel compelled to now start sharing stuff about myself. So the conversation gets into a real comfortable flow and not once, have I ever gotten into a situation where it's like religion and, and, and politics where people start arguing because I'm supporting and not, and not judging them. 
and they're sharing something that they care about. At this stage, I can go into different conversations and things like that. It's an icebreaker. But if I'm in, a, in an interview, if I'm interviewing to work at a company or to get promoted at a company, I want to know who I'm working with. I really want to know who they are, not just what I can see on the organization chart and what's in the job description. And if I'm interviewing someone to work at my place, I also want to know who they are. I want to know their passions. What, what, yeah. I use the word passion a lot. Some people are a little less comfortable. I want to know what their motivations are, what their hopes and dreams are. And this makes them feel comfortable sharing these things. And it's really joyful. Even when they share something that I don't care about or I don't know about, it's still what happens. Their passion, their talking about it engages me, even if they're talking about something I don't really care that much about. In Annette's case, I really did care about it. Travel leadership makes a lot of sense to me. And I want to hear more about it. But it always, it basically always works. Now, normally what I would say is at this stage, I would say it's your turn. Now, the technology and we're not in person makes it a little more challenging, but I want to say the, the slide with the script on it, you will get that. And I recommend printing it out and sitting down with coworkers, husbands, wives, kids. You can do this with virtually anyone and you can show them at the beginning, here's the script that I'm working with. I'd like to practice it with you. In fact, one of the, I remember one time doing this with a guy who was trying to develop his relationship with the CEO. And I said, practice the script. And he said, oh, I'll practice it with my wife. And my, usually, my usual way of working with my clients is we work for, um, I give them the exercise, and then a week later, they come back and tell me how it went. And so he, I had him do this exercise twice a day uh, for a week to practice, not with the CEO. That's where it counts. First, practice it with people who are close with you. Get the rhythms down, get the patterns down, get comfortable with it. You don't want to be figuring out nuances when you're talking to the CEO you want to work out the nuances when you're doing it with your friends. Anyway, he came back and he said, I sat down with my wife with a script. I printed it out. I, I showed her, I'm going to do these steps. And she, and he said, by the, by step three, she was sharing with me things that she never shared before. And they'd been married nine years. So it works with virtually everyone. When you do it, I recommend going back and forth, do it with someone so that you do the odd numbered steps and also do it where they do the odd numbered steps. And you're the one who answers. Why? Because the deliverables on this for the exercise to develop the skills so that you can do this without, without thinking about it is that when you are the person questioning, your job is to get to the meaning caring words and ask them what those meaning caring words are or, or to clarify them. Because a lot of people remember this exercise as, oh, what's your passion? That's just getting off out of the starting blocks. It's when you use those meaning caring words, the other person feels great. In fact, if I asked Annette, she already answered. I, in person, I often ask people, how did you feel when I, do you remember when I used the meaning caring words? And she actually said earlier what the most common answer is, I felt listened to. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what point made her feel listened to, but I suspect using the meaning, meaning caring words was a big part of it. The other, the, the other answer I get is I felt understood. Another very powerful feeling that people love to get. Now, if you're doing this exercise and someone is asking you the questions, notice how you feel when you're being asked. Usually at the beginning, people feel a little nervous. Why are they asking me about some detail? Why are they asking me about a passion? But by the end of it, this is designed to go from, yeah, it might be a little, making the person a little uncomfortable at the beginning, but by the end, they feel very comfortable. But you feel it for yourself because that's how you're going to make other people feel. And I want to remind you, this exercise is not just about asking what's a passion of yours. It's about making them feel supported and following up with them. It's asking them, you know, talking about people in your life and giving their reasons in a supportive, non-judgmental way. That creates a relationship of support and non-judgment between you and the other person. They expect that if they share with you, you'll support them and not judge them. That feels great to them. Then when you use their meaning caring words, they feel like not only does this person support me, he or she listens to me. If you want your teams working at top levels and not just pure transaction, you want them having each other's backs, knowing what they're gonna do even before they say what they're gonna do. Meaningful connection, it's not the only thing to do it, but it's a big thing that makes a difference. So I wanna talk about the emotional experience. When, someone says, when you say to someone, what's your passion? I hope you see, when I look at this cat, I see a kind of nervous, protected, little like, I'm kind of curious, but I'm staying protected. So I'll just give a little bit of an answer. And I want to point out a lot of people, they 
go off script and they do something which this exercise does not do. This exercise does, does not say to ask them, oh, really? Why? So if she had said, when she said travel, I could have said, really, why? Now, nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't support. It actually has them go out farther on a limb where they're feeling less supported because we've all been talking to kids and the kid says, why, 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 why? And no matter what you answer, they keep asking why. And we don't want to get, we don't want to imply to the person that they're going to be, you, they're going on a limb and you ask them to go farther out on a limb and you ask them to go farther out on a limb because then they're going to stop. They're going to feel interviewed. Instead, step three says, here are two motivations, two people and their motivations. And so this is a cat that's very close to the trunk of the tree. This exercise makes you a solid trunk that people can feel comfortable, solid, knowing that you are supporting them. And when you use their meaning carrying words and they feel listened to, they feel something inside them that can finally share. And that little kitten, there's a lion inside them and you, you enable that lion to come out for people. If you're in HR, if you're working with teams, you want your teams, you want the people in those teams to feel, I can express myself. If I do, I'll feel supported. The more that I express myself, the more I can express myself. I'm gonna bring all I can to this project, to this team, to this company, to everything that I do. This again is the exercise so that when you get the slides, this is the one to print out. And I'm gonna give you some homework. You don't have to do this, but if you really wanna get this exercise working, I recommend doing meaningful connection at least 10 times. Again, you can do it multiple times with the same person. And the more that you do it, like playing a scale on the piano, the first couple times you play it, you're like mechanical, okay, I'm hitting this key, then this key, then this key. There's no music in it, but you practice and practice and practice. Eventually you start discovering the music underneath it. And you'll pick up the patterns and you'll see, oh, this is what happens when I support the person. And sometimes it will go differently. Someone, they won't really give you much of an answer and you'll figure out how to do more, how to dig yourself out of a hole if you, did, if you went off script or something like that. So do it at least 10 times. So once a day for the next 10 days, twice a day for the next five days, something like that. And I recommend starting at least five times with supportive people. So the first five times, friends, family, people that you know, colleagues, people who aren't gonna judge you too much, people are gonna support you. And I recommend telling them that you're doing it. After you practice it enough and you feel comfortable, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to say, hey, do you mind if I do this meaningful connection exercise when you're at some um, uh, industry conference or some other situation? You can just say to the person, oh, I wonder if you don't mind sharing something that you'd like to do besides work and family. Then just go on to the more challenging people. And I recommend at least once with a person that you want to lead. So someone that you're wondering, how can I lead this person? Maybe there's someone you report to, maybe someone who reports to you, maybe someone you want, to, you want to make a sale to, you want to get a connection from. After you've done it and you're comfortable with it, try it with them and see if you don't feel like, I can lead this person more effectively now, now that I know something about them. And then this quote by Charlie Parker, first you've got to learn your instrument, then you practice, practice, practice. Then when you finally get up on the bandstand, forget all that and just wail. So if you listen to me on my podcast, you'll hear me do meaningful connection with people every now and then. I mean, you'll hear it go step by step, but I'm not trying to do it. I just do it. I'm, I've practiced and practiced and practiced. So it's second nature to me. And I just go up and just wail. And sometimes like the podcast episode that I just posted with a major league baseball pitcher, uh, Brent Suter from the um, Milwaukee Brewers, we have a great conversation. He's a major league baseball player. That to me, an old me would feel very intimidated by talking to someone like that. But now it's just, I can't say we're buddies, but I'm looking forward to, well, you'll hear what we talk about when we talk about, um, well, it's environmental stuff, but he gets really into it and I get really into it. And it was really fun. With that, I wanna thank you. I've gone over, but I hope not too much over. And I wanna be available for questions if people have any questions. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Kristen and she is, she's asking for your second step, why do you say I know two people versus one? Is there a science behind giving two versus one example? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I've practiced with one, two, and three. And I find that with, if I do three people, it's too long and I start, the person starts disengaging. It's different for different people but it starts being me talking about myself. And they, they just start like, oh, Josh just asked me about a passion so he could talk about himself for so long. That's the impression that I get. And when I do it with one person, if I say, here's one person to, um, 
if she'd said travel and I say, oh, I travel and here's my reason. Is that why you do? I often get, nope. And the conversation, and the conversation just ends right then. Now practice it yourself and it will depend on the relationship you have with the person. But in my experience, the one is too few and it leads to a short answer. Three is too many and they, they disengage. But two, and also I can tell you when I have it done with me, when someone says the first person, I'm like, no, that's not me. That's not exactly it. And then the next person, I'm like, that's definitely not me. Look, 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 if you think that's about me, I got to tell you really about me. So practice it yourself to get the feel of it for yourself. But I predict that you'll get similar things. If you, one, they don't, they you just get a short answer. Conversation ends. Three, it's too long. But then have people do it with you and tell me or see for yourself how it feels. Okay. So John, obviously John is, uh, John says interesting concept, would love to get the script to practice, which will be made available. And Charles, uh, and Kristen says totally makes sense. Thank you for the answer. And Charles is saying, if you are one of the two people, wouldn't it be better if you were the second? Ah, so oh, he says you just answered uh, his question. I'll add to that anyway, that I often use myself if I relate with the person in some way, but I don't have to. The people can be anyone that, sometimes the challenge is someone will say something that has nothing to do with anything in your life. For example, once I was doing this with a, a, another professor at, at Columbia Business School, and he told me his passion was falconry, and I'd never heard of falconry before. I don't know if anyone has heard of falconry, but it's like this thing where you go hunting with, with falcons and birds of prey. I didn't know that at the time. And so I just said, oh, I have a friend who, um, she's got this pet dog and, and she, I talked about the dog and how much she loves the dog. And I have another friend who's got a pet cat and I talked about how much he loves the pet cat and what the cat is about for him. I said, is that what it's like for you? Now, pet dogs and pet cats, have, they're pretty actually far apart, apart from falconry, but it was enough to engage the guy. And actually since then, years, this was years ago and I still talked about falconry, you don't have to be that close. And the people don't have to be people that they know. It, it can be really vague or really disconnected because the person really wants to talk about their thing. And if you get just reasonably close, they'll want to talk and they'll, they'll get to talk. So you don't have to be that precise. Now, the first couple of times you do it, I recommend after they say their thing, after say, if I was doing this for the first time, after Annette said travel and I was working with her and I had the thing printed out in front of her, I would say, okay, can you pause for a second? And I think to myself, okay, who's person one? Who's person two? What's their reason? What's the other person's reason? And then I would speak. So the first five times you do it, I recommend not trying to go on the fly as I did, but rehearsing a little bit like that. I should also mention, I forgot to make a slide for this. If people want to practice this with me, contact me, schedule a time, and I will do this with you for you being on this call with me. And so, I, hopefully you see it, hopefully it's on the screen, but josh at spodek.net, feel free to contact me, schedule an appointment, and we can do this together. Now I see we're bumping up, I hope, it's, I, hope I haven't gone into the next person's time. <laughs> no, almost, but not. We have three minutes left, but thank you very much, Josh. That was really great. Um, that was really awesome. And Annette for participating. Thank you, Annette, yes. Um, and yeah, I will um, either send your contacts to everyone who's on the call or uh, the other way around. So I'll just make sure that uh, you guys can communicate. You can all communicate with each other. I think uh, your exercise is in demand. Uh, I think people would like to have the exercise to do it. The questions, the questionnaires. So thank you all very much. Yes. Go ahead, please. Say what you have to, what do you Oh, what? no, I was just going to thank, thank you all very much. And I'd love to hear how things go. If it works for you, if it doesn't work for you, let me know how I can help. If it helps, I'd love to hear about your success stories. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Okay.